The Northeast Corridor in the U.S. Is, the Northeast Corridor in the U.S. is a continuous string of cities and suburbs that stretches for over 450 miles from Washington, D.C. in the south to Boston in the north. Home to over 50 million people, one out of every six Americans lives here. D.C. is the southern anchor with just over 6 million people, and Boston is the northern anchor with just over 5 million. At the center is New York City with a metro area population of over 20 million. About 80 miles southwest of New York City is Philadelphia with a metro population of about 6.4 million people, with about a third of those people being on the New Jersey side of the river. New York City and Philadelphia are one of only five large city pairs in the U.S. that are linked by commuter rail. There's Los Angeles and San Diego, which are around 120 miles apart, coming in at around 22 million people combined. Chicago and Milwaukee, 93 miles, have about 11.3 million people. Baltimore and Washington, D.C. are less than 40 miles apart, but combined, those regions number around 9.8 million. San Francisco Bay Area has Oakland, San Francisco, and San Jose in it. None of those cities are more than 50 miles apart, but together they add up to about 9.7 million. There are no two cities in North America that are as large and as close together as Philly is to New York. The combined megapolitan region of New York and Philadelphia is around 31.4 million people. But wait, there's a whole other state in between New York and Philly that represents nine of those 31 million people. Yeah, which begs the question, if New York City is in New York and Philadelphia is in Pennsylvania, why doesn't New Jersey have a big city in it? And the answer is, it's complicated. Welcome to Urban Legends. I'm Jim. I studied city planning at Rutgers and at the University of Queens. Queensland. 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 I've been studying and working and planning and development for most of the last 25 years. Thanks for joining me. Cities usually wind up where they are because of favorable geography, like good farmland or a large natural harbor, preferably both. They grow as they do because of the services they provide and the size of the local or regional populations that they support. And there are well-developed theories around why this is, like central place theory, Zipp's law, and other concepts like demographic gravitation. Uh, don't take my word for it. The links are in the description, but if you're in a hurry, you can follow along here. So the nutshell version of all that theory is that you don't need highly specialized financial or medical services in Princeton because the people who live here already have access to those services in New York and in Philly. Moving those goods and services to Princeton would only be cannibalizing the existing customer base and talent pool in New York and Philly. In other words, decentralizing it. Certain industries can only really function when they serve a broad geographical area with a large population base. Most people understand this intuitively. Like, if you want to get a flight from here to London, you're not going to find one at the airport in Trenton. You're going to have to go to Newark or Philly. It's not that complicated. A lot of people just don't spend much time thinking about it. The only part of New Jersey that's not within 60 miles of New York or Philadelphia is Cape May. I really like this map because it's basically the Venn diagram that explains Central Jersey. Yes, it exists. So for mid-tier shopping, medical services, a smaller regional airport, people in Cape May might head to Atlantic City, but for anything larger than that, they're gonna need to go to Philly. It's not that New Jersey doesn't have cities. Newark is a big city in its own right. It has major universities, it has a big international airport, and until recently, it had both an NBA and an NHL team. Some have argued that the only way to both break the dominance of the Yankees in Major League Baseball isn't to have 20 teams in the playoffs. It's to bring baseball back to Montreal and to bring a third team back to New York, which was the case when the Giants were in Manhattan and the Dodgers were in Brooklyn. And if you're asking me, Newark or Jersey City would be great locations. Baseball aside, were Newark not in the shadow of New York, it would be much more prominent, but because New York City is so massive, Newark gets relegated to edge city status. So how did we get here? Well, I flew 
and then I took a train, then I took another train, and I took the light rail, and then I took an elevator to get up to the top of this hill. But, I mean, how did New York get on that side of the river and not this side of the river? And the answer is topography. The Dutch began to settle the region they called New Netherland around 1614. The Dutch called the Hudson the North River and the Delaware the South River. And the North River was in regular use until about 100 years ago when Hudson became more common. In both places, the Dutch saw a landscape that they recognized from back home, and they cut some deals with the Lenape natives to start farming the lowlands. The English conquest of New Netherland began about 50 years later in 1664. Once the British conquest was complete, they quickly redrew the colonial boundaries into what we recognize today. It was easy to make colonial boundaries along major rivers as there was little question as to the precise location of that boundary. And the English seemed to be a fan of doing just that, but the reason that New York is on that side of the Hudson and not this side is only partly rooted in that political history. Most of the reason that the city wound up east of the Hudson comes down to the lay of the land. The New Jersey side of the river wasn't a practical place to grow a city. Much of the western side of the river has tall cliffs that run parallel to the Hudson. These are known as the Palisades, and they only turn slightly inland as they continue south through Jersey City. Imagine having to offload goods from a ship and then get them up that cliff face. Manhattan was an easier place to defend from attack, and it had better farmland. It sloped gently towards the river and had rolling hills in its northern reaches. It was also more easily accessible by ship from Long Island and cities in New England. Fast forward to the railroad era, and New Jersey began to catch up to New York in terms of development. Once there were reliable and mechanical means to get heavy things up big hills, development became a lot easier. But at the same time, this part of New Jersey was also becoming a shipping hub. In the 19th century, trains from everywhere in the U.S. west of the Hudson either terminated in Hoboken or in Jersey City, or they had to go north to Albany to cross the river. So if you didn't want to waste six hours of travel time going all the way up to Albany and then back down, you took the train right here to Hoboken and you transferred to a ferry. And you can still do that today if you feel so inclined. This Hoboken transfer remained the only practical way to get to Manhattan via rail from anywhere west of the Hudson until 1906 when the North River tunnels were built. For what it's worth, a very similar thing happened with Oakland in California. The Transcontinental Railroad terminated in Oakland and one had to transfer to a boat to get to San Francisco. Even though most goods and services had to stop in Oakland first, it still plays second fiddle to San Francisco. Back in New Jersey, as ships grew larger, and especially after containerization, New Jersey developed an advantage. New Jersey was better connected to the continental freight rail and highway networks, and could host a deeper port than what the Brooklyn terminals on the East River had been home to. By the 1970s, almost all shipping was in and out of Port Elizabeth, in the immediately adjacent Port Newark. But none of this mattered much. By the mid-1800s, New York's primacy was all but guaranteed. All of the technological advancements of the mid to late 1800s that spurred development in New Jersey, things like the internal combustion engine, electricity, elevators, etc., also further cemented New York's primacy. Here at the other end of New Jersey, Philadelphia was chosen as a site for Penn City because, like New York, it was also between two rivers. One river, the Schuylkill, could be relied upon for drinking and irrigation, and the other river, the Delaware, for shipping. Penn's site was also located at a bend in the Delaware River. This meant that the river was nice and deep on the Pennsylvania side and shallow and marshy on the New Jersey side. It turns out, somewhere in the swamps of Jersey is an adage much older than lifetime. In terms of land close to the rivers at either end of the state, there wasn't much Goldilocks. It was either wetlands or rocky uplands. On the Camden side of the Delaware, it was mostly wetlands, and still to this day, the Cooper River and Newton Creek are mostly surrounded by parks. The state and county have gone to great lengths to increase the amount of park space around these water bodies by knocking down old warehouses, tearing out parking lots, because flooding is still a problem. And hopefully it's clear in this video how flat the area is and how much of the floodplain in the Delaware River is actually on the New Jersey side. Away from the rivers, New Jersey was great for timber and then for farming. There's a reason we still call it the Garden State, but away from the big rivers isn't a great place for shipping. 200 years ago, there were no big cities that weren't near a navigable body of water. And even today, 185 years out from the beginning of the railroad era, only six of the 25 largest metro areas and 13 of the 50 largest metro areas 
are neither near an ocean nor a big river. The first railroad bridge across the Delaware was built in 1834 and connected Morrisville, Pennsylvania with Trenton, New Jersey. Right behind me is the furthest navigable point on the Delaware River. And as you go south from here, it gets gradually wider, which makes bridge building more expensive. There just wasn't enough going on outside of farming on the South Jersey side of the Delaware to justify the cost of multiple road and rail crossings. The Delaware Bridge from Philly to Camden, technically Pensalkin, wasn't operational until 1896. South Jersey just wasn't economically important enough to build multiple bridges to. It was between nothing and on the way to nowhere. There was no major industry outside of the Camden waterfront, and that was already connected to Philly by a robust ferry and barge network. Camden was also already connected to North Jersey via the Camden and Amboy Railroad. Goods were barged up the Delaware River here to Burlington City, loaded onto trains, and then trained up to Perth Amboy, where they would then be transferred to ships again for the final leg of the trip to New York City. Let's talk politics. No, 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 not sports, not big P politics, but little P politics, as in civics. Almost no one moves to New Jersey because they want to be in a big city. If anybody wants big city life, they don't have to travel very far. And that was just as true 150 years ago as it is today. By the 1890s, the suburbs across New Jersey were booming. Yeah, the 1890s. Most people in New Jersey already understand this, but for anyone else who might not, anyone who tells you that the suburbs magically appeared in the 1950s either doesn't know what they're talking about or they're lying to you on purpose. Suburbs are almost as old as the country is, and certainly as old as railroads are. Almost as a rule, railroads were in the real estate business. It was really common for them to buy a bunch of farmland or just vacant forest land, build a station in the middle of it, and then sell all the land around it for a profit. Towns like this one sprouted up like wildfire all over New Jersey. In what became pretty routine from the 1890s through to the 1920s. This was also a time of rapid technological innovation. So fast forward to 1920, and there's this expectation that if you have a house in a town <laughs> like this one, that you're also gonna have municipal services like sewer, water, street lighting, electricity, paved roads. And this wound up putting the people in the towns at odds with the farming communities around them. Why should farmers have to pay for all these municipal services when they're not gonna have access to them in the first place? And even if they did, wouldn't necessarily need them. So while some suburban New Jersey voters were demanding municipal services, but were surrounded by farmland, other voters were concerned about the creep of machine politics in their big city neighbors. They had chosen to move away from that, and no one in the suburbs wanted to be annexed by Newark or Patterson. This sparked a fever that's been called boroughitis. So in large part to pay for municipal services, people who were living in small towns drew really tight boundaries to exclude the farmers, and they had local elections to incorporate these new boroughs. Hundreds of boroughs were incorporated across the state and that prevented larger cities like Newark, Camden, Trenton, New Brunswick, Patterson, etc., from growing beyond whatever their boundaries were in the 1890s through the 1920s. Boroughitis is not unique to New Jersey. With 20 million people, the New York metro area has, yeah, 659 cities and towns. But Chicago is about half the size and has 571. Pittsburgh has 463. St. Louis, 393. Philadelphia has 385. Boston, 201. San Francisco, 88. And Los Angeles, 154. So in some alternate reality where boroughitis never happens, maybe a city like Trenton winds up a little bit bigger, but Mercer County doesn't wind up with more people in it. You just wind up rearranging the people who are already here. So sure, downtown Trenton might be a lot bigger, but that's just because you've pulled the office space off of Route 1 and you've moved it down here. Boroughitis didn't just prevent cities from growing geographically. It also prevented them from growing economically. It forced them all to compete for the same population and tax base to pay for services. 
while also delivering the same high level of services to ensure that they didn't lose population or business to their neighbors. It was almost like a race to the top, and it would have been if it didn't just about bankrupt everyone. And that whole process also really doomed the larger industrial cities in the state when deindustrialization took hold. There was no vacant land left in the cities where new industries could set up shop. The contamination in the industrial age made redevelopment of old industrial sites risky for a long time. That is, until we got the federal Superfund program in the 1980s. There is also no way for those cities to annex new industries or new subdivisions in the suburbs to even keep their budgets in the black. So compare Newark for a minute, hemmed in on all sides by other towns to a city like Charlotte or Phoenix, both of which have annexed large parts of the counties that they're in and are nowhere near done annexing. Phoenix in 1953 was 17 square miles. Today, it's over 500 square miles and not done growing. The 24 square miles of Newark is the same today as it was in 1929. Cities like Charlotte or Phoenix grow fast because a new subdivision or shopping center will get built on the fringes of the city and they'll just annex it. And they'll keep annexing that new development on the outskirts until they run into the boundaries of another city where they get to the limits of the county that they're in. But in New Jersey, there is no unincorporated area to annex. Everywhere already has a city government, and the only way a city or town can grow is by merging with other existing towns, which is politically difficult. In my lifetime, the only two towns I've ever heard of merging are Princeton Borough and Princeton Township. New York and Philly had similar problems in terms of being geographically constrained, but both cities were already large in land area and still had vacant land in the 1950s. New subdivisions were going up in Queens into the early 50s and in Staten Island and Northeast Philly into the early 80s. Both cities still had big problems to be sure, but they had enough room for some growth to bridge the gap from the late 60s through to the Superfund era. Newark was built out by the 1920s and had no chance. Jersey City, on the other hand, was better positioned to win the Superfund sweepstakes, in part because of its proximity to the financial capital of the world, but also because the waterfront was full of large former industrial sites ripe for redevelopment. As soon as they could get cleaned up, of course. So there you have it. Central place theory, topography, and politics. And in the end... What we still have is counties with 40 school districts, 40 police departments, and 40 public works departments. And almost always at least one of those towns is a dumping ground for all the stuff that no one else wants. The town I grew up in was three square miles with around 5,000 residents. Three of the neighboring towns were almost identical in size and population, and no one visiting us from out of state could ever tell where one town ended and the other began, or what the difference even was. That redundancy alone explains most of the insanely high property taxes in the state. Welcome to New Jersey. If you've made it this far, thank you. There's more videos on the way. Let me leave you with this one caveat. There's a bit of a cottage industry that's grown up around insisting that municipal consolidation doesn't save money. And almost all of it ignores that most municipal mergers that have occurred in the past have done so for the purpose of spending money on infrastructure or services things they would have paid a lot more for had they not merged. When you account for these things, and especially when you account for inflation and the savings in pension and healthcare costs over the long term, the savings are really unquestionable. I'm Jim. This is Urban Legends. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.